Beautiful morning, church, to worship our God, to be together. We are thankful and grateful for this opportunity and a blessing to assemble and to commune with our Lord and to commune with one another as we have done in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And now we have this opportunity to study God's Word. I appreciate James. Uh, He was nervous to read a scripture for me before I uh, preach. I'm usually in uh, where I was at in Shawnee. I always had a scripture reader. And so uh, that's something that I've I've missed. We may uh, may look to do some of that some more uh, in the future. But uh, turn to your, uh, if you have your Bibles, and do you have your Bibles, church? Let's raise our Bibles up. All right. No songbooks now. I I can see some of you. I see some of you grabbing songbooks each week. I know. I know the difference. Ephesians chapter 6. Armed for battle, soldiers of Christ arise. I don't know if you knew that or not, but as a Christian, you are a soldier. The Bible gives us this imagery very uh, very clearly and very often in Paul's writing. He depicts the Christian walk, the Christian life as one uh, as a warfare, engaging in a battle. And we are soldiers of Christ. I'm concerned about how Christianity seems to be glamorized is what I want to call it. You walk into Mardell's Christian bookstore, you go to Lifeway uh, Christian bookstore, and it's just so smooth, soothing, it smells good, there's nice, soft, peaceful music being played, there's coffee that you can enjoy, Uh, there's wonderful pictures and literature there. And I'm just afraid that as Christians, we kind of, that's how we think Christian living should be and is is about. Folks, that is not the image of Scripture that Scripture gives us. And I'm thankful for those Christian places and bookstores and things we can go to. But Christianity is not depicted and is not that way. It is a fight. It is a battle. We are engaged in a spiritual war. And I'm excited this morning to begin a new series that that I'm calling Armed for Battle. We're going to be looking at the next several weeks, primarily here in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. The passage here that as Paul concludes his letter to the Ephesian, uh, to the Christians at Ephesus, he wants them to know something. He wants them to be aware of a a very, a very intense reality. He wants them to understand that as they live for the Lord, as they serve Jesus Christ, as they live out their faith, He wants them to realize that there is an intense battle that's going on. We are engaged as Christians in a very intense war for our souls, for our hearts and minds, for our, for our souls. And this is what Paul wants them to to realize. He wants them to keep that in mind as they live out their life. That the reality is that just below the the calm surface of our day-to-day existence, we are engaged every day in a very intense battle. And it's this battle that I want to speak about over the next several weeks as we think about being armed for this conflict, being armed for the battle that Paul gives us here Uh, particularly in Ephesians chapter 6 here. So we're going to spend a few weeks on this. So uh, this won't be one or two weeks. We'll spend several weeks looking at at this uh, incredible uh, passage. And Paul, I want us to think about a couple of things here as we kind of of introduce this this morning. We're only going to look at the first uh, verses 10 through 13 of Ephesians 6. But Paul wants us to understand a couple of things here. The first is we need to understand about this battle, this, the nature of our struggle. Paul wants us to understand the intensity here of this struggle. And he uses a word here. He says there in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul uses this word, this Greek word that we have translated struggle. 
And Paul had at his discretion a number of Greek words that he could have used. And I believe supernaturally inspired by the Holy Spirit, he used this word. And this word is interesting, the word that he gives us here. It's a word that describes the conflict as being a close quarters fight, a hand-to-hand type of a battle. Paul uses that imagery here that he wants us to understand about the nature of this conflict to help us understand this. It's it's like hand-to-hand battle. You know, there are a lot of ways to engage in warfare. There are a lot of ways that people have destroyed one another, nations, armies. And I think we're at the point in our time, in our world, especially as America, where because of the technology, we're able to fight war and battles kind of from a distance. I mean, we're able to come in with, 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 uh, with bombs, and uh, I mean, we're just able to kind of fight it from a distance a little bit. We're not a lot of times able to get up close, look in the eyes of our, of our enemy, kind of feel their breath, kind of feel them, their presence there right in front of us. And Paul wants us to understand that that's, that's not what we're dealing with. This is a very intense, very personal uh, battle, conflict, close quarters fight that we're engaged in. I don't remember, know if you've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. It's one of the most intense movies I've ever seen. It's not a movie for children uh, in no sense of the, the, the word. Uh, this movie won a number of Oscars for its depiction of the kind of realism uh, in the, uh, the landing of, of Normandy in World War II. And it tells the story that I don't want to get into all the details of, uh, of, a, of a unit that's sent to look for a private who's lost uh, 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 several brothers that had, have died in the uh, conflict, and they're, in, they're sent in to get him out of there and send him home. But in that story, if you remember towards the end of that movie, they're, uh, they're, they're, they, they have to secure a bridge. Uh, there's an incoming large German uh, force that's coming in. They're at this little uh, worn, ravaged, uh, destroyed city, town, and they're held up there, and they have a smaller group there. And uh, this large German force is coming uh, at them to this city. And so they're outnumbered, they're outmanned, and so they begin to kind of place themselves strategically around the city, if you remember the the town. And there's one guy that has, uh, he's a, a machine gunner, and he's positioned up high where he has a good view uh, and good position to fire. And uh, basically as the, the, the conflict begins there in that part of the movie, uh, they're outnumbered, they're outgunned, and uh, particularly that guy up high on the machine gun, he's up in an attic building, uh, he runs out of ammunition. And if you remember the movie, there's a, a, a single German soldier that comes up there and they, they meet each other in that room. And they are in a hand-to-hand fight. It's one of the most vivid, intense scenes I've ever seen in a movie. And matter of fact, when I watch that movie from time to time, I'll just usually fast forward through that part, some of that. It's so intense what happens in that scene if you've seen that movie. Up close, hand-to-hand battle. Church, that's what we're engaged in here. We're not in some sort of glamorized, soft, from a distance conflict. We are engaged in a close quarters hand-to-hand fight spiritually for our life every day, every single day. And Paul wants us to understand that as he describes uh, the intensity of this, of this battle. And he also tells us about our enemy. He says here that in verse 12, we're up against, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This intense fight that we're involved in is against cosmic cosmic intelligences. We are facing a spiritual foe, a spiritual enemy. And he describes them here as the rulers, the powers of the, the, this dark world. That just beyond our sight, there is another dimension of existence. We sometimes forget that. That when God created, He created both visible and invisible. I believe that's a reference primarily to the angelic beings. And there is an invisible world 
that is very much out of our sight, but is very much a part of our existence. Powers, rulers, spiritual forces, we are fighting the demonic. We are fighting Satan himself, and he will identify Satan of being uh, the commander-in-chief of the opposing uh, enemy army. And Paul here is giving us a glimpse in that cosmic, that invisible, demonic world. And here most scholars believe with these references to uh, the rulers, authorities against the powers, that there's some sort of a ranking hierarchy. There's some sort of a, of a structured order here that, there, that, they, that exists there. And I'll tell you what, church, I've got a lot of questions about a lot of this. And I know you're having questions probably. This is a topic that we have a lot of questions about angels and about demons and about the unseen realm. And we don't have time to get into that. And it's not because I, we don't have time. I guess we do if we, if we wanted to. There's just not a lot of information given to us. Scripture doesn't give us the details about that other than the reality exists. That there is an invisible world of spiritual forces, of demonic, that we are facing. We're facing Satan himself who's behind all of this. We're not just up, up, up against some kind of a ragtag group. We are up against the forces of evil, Satan himself. And all of his demons and his demonic hordes, we're battling. And here he says down in verse uh, 13 that, um, that we'll be able to, as he identifies there in verse 11, against the devil's schemes, Satan himself, uh, we, are, we are up against. But we need to realize we're involved in a great spiritual conflict and battle that's going on right now in our lives. I'll give you a picture here. This is a, this, this location is the ancient city of Megiddo. Uh, it's in this valley. There's a, uh, there's a road here, uh, the, 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 Via, uh, the Via Maris Road. It's alongside a, a large mountain. Uh, this is about 60 miles west of Jerusalem. And this is probably, more battles have been fought probably in human history uh, in this location than any other place. Uh, it's really because of the road here that, that goes through. This connects all the way up to Arabia. Uh, so it connects all the way up into Asia. And it also can go south down into Egypt, into the African continent. So there's a road here that goes alongside this mountain range. There's a pass. And there's a city that sits, sits down here, this valley of Megiddo. And if you want to control uh, commerce, if you want to pass back and forth from north-south to the, to the Asian African continents, this is an area you're going to have to control. And so a lot of, a lot of history, a lot of military battles have been fought here. And uh, it's interesting here that the apostle, or the apostle John in the book of Revelation uses this imagery in Revelation 16 and verse 16. When writing about this imagery of Megiddo, he talks about this battle of, of Har Megiddo. We probably know it, the word as Armageddon is the word that we, we have translated. And for a lot of religious folks, they believe that, they believe that and there's a map there of, uh, of Megiddo, they believe that the battle of Armageddon is some future battle. It'll be the very final battle uh, before the end time between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and it's some future battle. Let me tell you something, that's not found in Scripture. We are in that battle right now. We are in that battle of Armageddon. We are in that conflict between the forces of God and those of Satan that would influence us for, uh, for His will. We're up against cosmic spiritual forces. We're in a very real fight, not for real estate, but for our souls and for eternity. And so Paul here talks about the enemy here, and I wish I could answer all the questions you have. What's, what's Satan's background? What's his origin? What about all of his demons? What are they doing right now? How are they influencing and tempting us? And all kinds of questions that we have. I have those kinds of questions. The Bible doesn't give us all of the details. But here's what the Bible does tell us, as we'll mention in just a minute. It is going to tell us the tactics of, the, of our enemy and how he comes at us. But it tells us the reality of what we're facing and what we're in. And secondly, though, 
It tells us about the nature of our orders, what God wants us to do in this battle. He gives us the nature of our orders. If you'll look at this word, stand firm, this phrase, stand firm. It's found three times here. Those are our orders. He tells us three times, finally be strong in the Lord and His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Uh, Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God when the day of evil comes so that you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. What's our orders in this battle? To stand firm. To hold our position at any cost. That's what he says. It's a military word here. Once again, does it surprise us with the imagery that Paul is giving us here? It's a military word. That's what God is telling us to do. When the battle is raging, when it's at its fiercest moment, if we're going to survive, we've got to stand. We've got to hold our position. We've got to, to be victorious in Jesus. There is... A historical, those who study and love to go visit the uh, Civil War uh, locations in our country, and lo- I love to study history and, and read about history, and particularly in military and battles that have been fought in our country. Of course, the Civil War. And there is a place that is uh, on the Tennessee River. It's near Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, it's near Savannah, Tennessee. And it was one of the most early critical battles that were fought in the Civil War between the North and the South. Uh, it's the, the Battle of Shiloh, and it's a fascinating story. Uh, Shiloh, it gets its name. There was a log cabin Methodist church there, where this battle is going to be, in, where the battle ensued around there, and it, it unfolded, and it was very important for the course of our country. Uh, in that spring of 1862 of April, uh, the uh, the Union general U- Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, had an army of 40,000 men that were camped uh, not too far from this area on the west side of the Tennessee River. And on their way to meet uh, General Grant's army was another general, a two-star general, uh, General General Don Carlos Bales. Uh, Bules, I'm sorry, Buell. And just just near that area, just south of that area, the the south had their army. There was an army there uh, led by uh, a general. Uh, of the Southern Army that uh, wanted to kind of uh, uh, catch catch off guard uh, Grant's forces. And so they they marched uh, quickly. Uh, They knew reinforcements were coming uh, to Grant's army. And so the Confederate Army was led by General Albert Sidney uh, Johnston, who wanted to kind of get there before those uh, uh, that other force, uh, Union Army of uh, of Buell's force uh, arrived to reinforce Bell. Uh, Buell's uh, army reinforced Grant's. And so they wanted to march, and they marched from uh, Corinth, Mississippi, and they got there before the merger of those two forces, and they caught them off guard. And it was on a Sunday morning, uh, and it was not too far from that log cabin Methodist church when uh, the guns started to uh, to blaze. And uh, they caught the, the Union forces uh, off guard, and uh, they pushed them back, and there was some, some woods there, and they, uh, they, they began to flee. Uh, they began to retreat uh, because they were overwhelmed. They were surprised by the, uh, by the uh, uh, Confederate uh, uh, army. And so they went off into this. There was this little wagon road not too far uh, from that area, and there was kind of down in a little ditch uh, where the road was kind of sunken down. And uh, there was uh, a brigadier general, uh, Benjamin uh, Prentice, who was there at, at, at command of those men, they were kind of pieced together from different uh, units that had been kind of staggered from that surprise attack from the uh, Confederates. And so they, they came to that little wagon road, kind of sunken down in the, in the road, and there they decided to take a stand. They were not going to continue to fall back and retreat. And the orders that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Prentice had from Grant was to maintain that position at all cost. The quote was, he was ordered to hold his position at all hazards, whatever the cost, and boy, the cost was heavy. The Union Army held their ground there, and against a barrage of Confederate uh, forces, 
Eventually, some 62 cannons were brought in, and they began to bombard one of the largest cannon uh, assaults in American history. They began to pound those, those Union uh, soldiers there uh, holding their ground. And, uh, and what did they, they began to, they, began to uh, ho- they just held their ground. And every time they would send another group in, Confederate soldiers would come in to try to get closer. Uh, they would get pushed back. And some of the soldiers would say, uh, historians note, that uh, Confederate soldiers would say it was like a hornet's nest in there. I mean, every time they went in there to get closer, they were pushed back. But they were pounded there. And for two hours, they were pounded by 62 cannons at close range. I mean, the dead was just piling up. But that Union force held their ground. Well, dark, uh, darkness came, and so they had to pull back. The Confederates had to pull back their uh, assault. And that gave the, uh, the Union soldiers time to regroup. And eventually, that reinforcement uh, army, Buell's army, came, reinforced them, and they were then able to go on the counteroffensive, push the Confederate army back. But it was all as a result of that army taking a stand, not going to go any further back. They were going to hold their position at all cost. And that's what God is telling us to do. We've got to stand firm. We've got to hold our position. And that's what, uh, that's what this call is, is about. But he also tells us here, finally, about at least these three, three, apple, three main points I want to bring, about the nature of our enemy. Quickly here, he doesn't give us all the details about our enemy, but he tells us about his tactics. We have kind of an, a divine intelligence report, if you will, kind of keeping the military terms And he tells us something about these cosmic intelligences that we're fighting against here. We can have enough information to be prepared for the battle to stand firm. And he tells us here about Satan. He tells us about his tactics. He says that he's crafty. He's cunning. Notice what he says here. Against the devil's schemes. He uses this word here of craftiness or or cunning. The idea is being very deceptive. It was a word used to describe animals of a predator who would be very careful and quietly sneak up on their prey and be very stealth-like as they would come in. As you can picture an animal that's a predator that's sneaking up quietly, softly, unnoticed, and then they pounce and then they jump and they're unexpectedly getting their their prey. And that's what Satan does here. He doesn't announce his presence. Very, very rarely will Satan attack openly. That's what we have to understand here about our enemy. And he's crafty. He's cunning. He's deceptive. He's really, if we want to use this word, his tactics, they're genius. His approach is really genius if you want to look at it that way. Satan's a genius? Well, yeah, in this sense, I guess. He wants us to lower our guard. He wants us to get relaxed and comfortable. He wants us to be soothed when we come into that Christian bookstore. I don't know, but he wants us to just be off guard. Everything is just peaceful, easygoing. We're relaxed. Our comfort is, 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 is there. Our guard is down. We're open. We're vulnerable to his attack. And that's exactly what he does. And Satan, some of the descriptions we have, he's diabolical, let me tell you. One that we have, we're going to look at some others as our series goes along. Look at one of these in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we get a glimpse of his evil but genius tactics, if you will. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, down here the Apostle Paul describes, look at verse 13. For such people, he talks about false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And then he says in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 11, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. That's incredible. That's a genius tactic-wise. Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. There are people, there are Christians who, whenever they see anything that looks good and holy and wholesome and righteous, and they think, boy, that must be true, watch out. 
Because Satan could be behind that, masquerading as an angel of light. You might hear me say some of this, and you might hear me say this and think, Robert, boy, you're almost saying we've got to be on the edge of our seat every day as we live our Christian life. If you're hearing me say that, you're getting the point. Because that's exactly what I'm saying. We cannot let our guard down. We've got to, in that sense, kind of be always on the edge of our, of our spiritual life. We've got to be ready for the tactics of Satan. Satan's a liar. He's a deceiver. John 8, he's a liar and there is no truth in him. That's his nature. Everything he does is about deception and falsehood. He's a liar. And he disguises himself as an angel of light. He will mix, listen to me, he will mix truth with error. He will mix that which is holy with that which is unholy. He'll mix them together. He'll deceive us. He'll get us thinking. He'll camouflage it. So we gotta be, we got to be open to his attack. We've got to be open to his attack. Let me give you two spiritual helps. And the lesson will be yours here. Two spiritual helps. I don't think I put these on the slide, so let me give them to you here. The first is you need to think about Satan every day. Every day of your life, you need to think about Satan. I don't know if you've ever had a preacher get up and tell you to think about Satan every day. I'll be the, if you haven't, I'll be the first one. You've been encouraged, as I will encourage you, to think about God every day, His Word, the blessings of God, His love, His grace, His mercy, His power, all of those things. You need to have a part of your daily thought process. Let me add one to your thought process, Satan. We need to be thinking about Satan. I think that's what Peter gets at in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 when he says, Be alert, be sober. Your enemy, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion. He's seeking someone to devour. That tells us you better be on the edge of your seat spiritually. You better be alert. You better be looking. Because Satan's there. He's ready to pounce. Let me give you a real example of this that I, we may not think about. In Matthew chapter 16, real quick. Matthew chapter 16. You know this story is where Jesus announces he's going to build his church based upon the the truth of the confession that Peter made, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And remember, Jesus says that even the forces of Satan will not be able to prevail, will not be able to stop his, uh, his kingdom from, from being established and advancing. And you remember, it's in this context that Jesus predicts his death to the apostles. And you remember what happens in verse 21 and 22? He tells them how he must suffer and die and be killed and be raised on the third day. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Do you remember what, look at verse 23 of Matthew 16. Look at Jesus' response to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. It's, it's amazing. It's genius. Satan used Peter, who was just kind of an unwitting pawn, he came at Jesus, Peter did, with compassion, with care, with love, with concern for Jesus. Jesus, this is not going to happen to you. We're never going to let this happen to you. And all the while, that's Satan working. And Jesus recognized it. He would not let Satan deceive him. That the, the way of salvation, God's plan was the cross. And Jesus was always aware of that, his keenly was keenly aware of that throughout his life, even in the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was aware of that. So you need to be thinking about Satan every day and the temptations, the areas that you're weak in and you're struggling in, you're vulnerable in, and watch out because Satan's not always going to come at you openly. He's going to use deception. He's going to masquerade himself many times. We've got to be aware of that. And then secondly, the armor of God. We've got to put on the armor of God. Let me tell you something. If you're thinking, boy, Robert, Satan is so powerful, He's so strong, and I'm so frail, and I'm so weak, and I'm vulnerable in so many areas. I don't have a chance against Satan. You're right. You don't. Church, put on the strength of God. Put on the power of God. Put on the armor of God. You're going to win this battle not with your strength, but with the Lord's strength. And we're going to be looking at that over the next several weeks, some of those pieces of those armor that we need to put on because this is through God's strength that we're going to overcome and be victorious. Just like last Sunday morning, remember we talked about David and Goliath? Whose power? 
Whose might was it? It was the Lord's power, the Lord's might that David defeated the giant. It's the same in your life. Spiritually, the things that you're struggling with, it's going to be through the power and strength that God provides in Christ Jesus. That's the only way we're going to be victorious is put on the strength and power that the Lord provides. You come at Satan on your own. You come at Satan off by yourself. You come at Satan unprepared with the spiritual armor pieces that we're going to describe. Satan, let me tell you, is going to clean your clock. It will be a first round KO. It won't even last very long. We've got to put on the... We are so frail. We're just so... It's in our... I believe we weren't born this way, but when we choose, our nature is now, in a sense, that flesh and blood, we just we struggle with sin and temptation, and by ourselves, we don't have a chance. Only through the power of God, through the blood of Jesus, can we, be, can we overcome. And that's what I want us to think about always in these lessons as well. Let me ask you the question this morning. How are you doing in the battle? How are you doing this morning in the battle? Maybe you didn't even know you were in a battle this morning, and right there tells us where to begin. You need to start preparing and being armed for this battle. And I hope you'll continue to come. I hope that you'll read our, you'll read our, our, our Bibles together and think about this. Maybe you haven't been taking a stand. Maybe you've been in retreat. You've been falling back. You're vulnerable. You're weak. You're, you seem, you, you, you're, out, you're outmanned. And you've just been falling back. It's time. I hope these lessons help us. It's time to take a stand. Take a stand where you're at spiritually and through God's strength and through God's power and through the armor of God that He provides and through the blood of the Lamb, you can overcome Satan. You can be a strong Christian in the Lord. You can this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never enlisted in the Lord's army. You've been watching the battle. You've been attending. You attend worship. You read your Bible. Maybe you pray. You're around other Christians, but you're not enlisted in the battle. You're not a soldier yet. You need to come to the Lamb of God in obedience to the gospel, in your faith, in your repentance, being immersed in water, putting Christ on in baptism. You begin the Christian life at that moment. And the Lord will arm you. He'll prepare you for a life of battle against Satan and temptation. Maybe that's your need this morning. If we can help you, come as we stand and sing.